uh, Dr. Broyles, uh, welcome uh, uh, this morning um, and sure appreciate your time talking to us about such a uh, such a common problem and uh, and constantly changing uh, in our view for for a problem that's been around for so so very long and and a whole new array of treatments and and uh, maybe you'll comment on uh, the relevance of type 2 diabetes to the COVID pandemic and and uh, which is also a huge deal I believe uh, but Thank welcome you. and thanks for your time this morning and go ahead of course yes thanks thanks for joining me um, I think um, I've met many of you in the past but I'm Fran Broyles and um, I'm the medical director for diabetes endocrinology and nutrition for Swedish Health Services. And yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about sort of a paradigm shift in the way that we are approaching the disease state of diabetes. Um, this, uh, you know, is a, uh, is a statement from the WHO, World Health Organization in 2016, which was that type two diabetes along with obesity may yet be the greatest chronic disease epidemic in the history of human existence. Um, the basis for this claim is the global rise uh, greater than twofold increase from 150 million people in 2000 with diabetes um, to 415 million currently, and the 2040 prediction of 642 million people worldwide with type 2 diabetes. So, obviously, a huge issue. In the United States, about 40 million Americans have diabetes, 90% of those are type 2. Um, n almost 90 million people have prediabetes, which is one in three. Um, and then over a five-year period without intervention, um, up to 30% of those individuals will convert to diabetes. We, I think we all know about the cost for caring for patients with diabetes. It's um, about almost two and a half fold higher than patients without diabetes. And prior to COVID, there were 250,000 deaths annually that were attributed to diabetes. COVID infection has been very interesting, you guys, because what has happened is that there has been almost a 30% increase in the development of type 2 diabetes um, after COVID exposure. So there appears to be a uh, causal impact from this infection that accelerates uh, the development of type 2 diabetes. So this is really worrisome, given that we already have really a severe epidemic. The new onset of type 1, so autoimmune diabetes, in some studies after COVID infection has been reported to be higher than 50%. So, you know, we, we're assuming that this is due to the degree of immune activation of this virus, which is staggering. Um, as many of you guys know, there have been reports of autoimmune diseases upticking during the COVID epidemic. Um, we do know that patients with type 2 diabetes are twice as likely to be admitted to the ICU and twice as likely to die of COVID. So this is a, an, an enormous risk in the world of COVID um, with reference to morbidity and mortality. So um, this is just a graph looking at the amazing acceleration in the diagnosis of diabetes. And this is back in 1958 on this side of the graph. And you can see just almost a vertical uptick that begins to happen around 1997. There's a lot of studies going on in this arena, you guys, as to why we suddenly just started accelerating at warp speed. But we certainly know that this is one of the major reasons. So um, currently about 70 to 75 percent of adult Americans are overweight or obese, with about 35% of Americans having a body mass index of greater than 30. Um, and this is a, is a map that I think a lot of you have seen. Um, the top section of the United States map is the incidence or the prevalence of obesity, i.e. a body mass index of greater than 30, Nin 1994, 2000, 2015, and certainly higher currently. Um, this is the uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes during those same years. And you can see that there's essentially, you can overlap these maps. So we know that obesity is one of the major driving issues in the epidemic of type 2 diabetes. And that is actually what led to this recommendation by the American Diabetes Association that was released in 2016. This is actually, this was actually an earth shattering recommendation by the American Diabetes Association. I happened to be at that meeting when this was presented where there were 
you know, more than several thousand endocrinologists in the room, and I think you could have heard a pen drop. This was, um, I, this is out of the purview of this lecture today, but I would just say that this was after an uh, exhaustive review of the literature on the safety and efficacy of bariatric surgery, and the recommendations in 2016 were if you have a patient with type 2 diabetes and a body mass index of greater than or equal to 40, um, you should be recommending bariatric surgery, regardless of glycemic control. If the body mass index is between 35 and 39, and they are not adequately controlled, then bariatric surgery is recommended. And if your body mass index is 30 to 35 with inadequate control, it should be considered. So you wanna subtract 2.5 for the Asian population, to correlate with what those recommendations are. I would emphasize that the ADA said that the surgery should be performed only in high volume centers with multidisciplinary teams who understand and are experienced with diabetes. And this is really based on the market decrease in morbidity and mortality um, seen in this population um, when they underwent bariatric surgery. Now, you know, I'm happy to take questions about this later. I also would like to emphasize that the FDA has now approved five drugs for the treatment of obesity alone, um, one of which is um, incredibly efficacious that came out last summer. Uh, it is a GLP-1 peptide that is used in diabetes called Ozempic. Uh, in the weight loss world, it is called Wegovy. So this is a, uh, if, you've, if you've ever heard me talk about diabetes, you've probably seen this slide. This is actually data from the United Kingdom trial. Um, this trial was published in 1999, a trial in the United Kingdom of type 2 diabetes. And this is a graph that I actually draw on my exam room paper every time I see a patient who comes in with new onset type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. So what this graph shows is the beta cell function decline over time. So time zero uh, is day one of diagnosis of type two diabetes. And at day one of diagnosis, 50% of beta cell function is gone. Um, there have been studies recently to show that 70% of beta cell function may be gone at day one of diagnosis. We know that the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is predated by about a decade of abnormal blood sugars, so-called pre-diabetes, uh, impaired glucose tolerance, impaired fasting glucose. Those are all sort of terms that are thrown around in this arena. But beta cell function is declining during this time frame, and it is absolutely critical that this is the time frame that we start treating patients aggressively. Because if we want to save beta cell function and we want to prevent the development of type 2 diabetes, we must intervene at this stage. So, you know, by the time somebody is labeled with prediabetes, about 25% of beta cell function is gone. And we are desperately trying to change the slope of this curve. So, you know, the million dollar question is that if I catch Joe here, can I keep him here until he's 110 so that he never gets diabetes? And I would tell you that we are getting a very um, much better at this. We're, we're uh, making some big inroads into this. If I catch Joe at day one of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, can I keep Joe here until he's 110 so he doesn't decline to a state where he needs insulin? Um, and that is also something that um, we have made huge inroads into. Um, this is a slide that really, for me, I just want to call out the issues of complication development. This is the natural history of type 2 diabetes. We know the gene for insulin resistance is inherited. Uh, the pancreas has to work harder to maintain normal blood sugars. Again, this is time zero, day one of diagnosis. This is 10 years back when glucose has become abnormal. And so for a while, the pancreas keeps up with, with the insulin resistance. But eventually, the pancreas starts to fail. And as the pancreas starts to fail, post-meal blood sugars begin to rise first, followed by fasting glucose elevation. The call out in this slide is that complications that have been attributed to type 2 diabetes develop in the pre-diabetes stage. And I think a lot of patients and some providers have this idea that pre-diabetes is a relatively benign state, and it absolutely is not. So 30% of patients with, with diabetes already have uh, complications at day one of diagnosis. 
That includes nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy. And macrovascular complications, heart attack and stroke, are, um, we already know are substantially increased in the pre-diabetes arena. So just in another call out that we need to be aggressively treating the disease state of pre-diabetes. Um, so I, I give a, a talk that is totally dedicated to the issue of the prevention of type two diabetes, but I don't really have the time to go through that today. I did want to show this slide, however, which is a slide that looks at multiple interventions that have shown been shown to delay or prevent the development of type two diabetes. Most of these trials were about three years. Um, the diabetes prevention trial is the most famous trial um, that was done in the United States. Um, it was a three-armed trial of exercise and weight loss, metformin alone or placebo. The exercise weight loss intervention in the diabetes prevention trial was losing 7% of your body weight and holding it. Um, exercising or being active for 150 minutes a week, most people walked and that showed a decreased conversion to diabetes by 60% in three years. So 7% weight loss, 150 minutes of activity, 60% decreased conversion. The metformin alone arm of that trial, so they didn't change their diet, they didn't exercise, decreased conversion by about 30%. A carbose, which is a drug that partially blocks carbohydrate breakdown in the small intestine. And when I talk to patients about this drug, it's sort of analogous to doing a low carb diet. That decreased conversion by 25%. Uh, pioglitazone, which is Actos, is the most powerful insulin sensitizing drug on the planet. This drug decreased conversion by 72% in three in about two and a half years. Rosiglitazone is also, um, it's off the market, but is a, um, a drug that is in the same category of thiazolidine dione. Orlistat, of course, we all know that's a drug that, that helps with weight loss. It blocks partial fat absorption. 37% reduction, Fentramine plus Topamax, one of the drugs that is approved by the FDA in the weight loss world, resulting in about 12% weight loss in this study, almost an 80% reduction in the conversion to type 2 diabetes, and bariatric surgery, a resolution of abnormal blood sugars for 10 years in 75%. So that is the driving issue. I would mention that GLP-1s are not on this graph um, and they have been shown to re reduce conversion upwards of 70%. And again, we think that a, a fair amount of that may be related to, of course, the weight loss issue, but there may be some beta cell uh, preservation impact from GLP-1s. Um, so I think one of the issues that is important in terms of diabetes and of course pre-diabetes is just activity. And you know, we kind of uh, say that exercise is a dirty word. Um, nobody likes to hear the word exercise and, and really it's just getting people to be active. You know, I tell my patients to drink a lot of water and every time they have to uh, get up to uh, urinate, they need to move for five minutes. Uh, so when they flush the toilet, their time begins, and I don't care what they do. They can do jumpy jacks in the bathroom. They can walk around their desk for five minutes. They can go up and down stairs. But if you drink a lot of water, um, you will pee at least six times a day, and that's 30 minutes of activity. So it really is just trying to get people to move. I'm not going to go through this list, um, but these are the risk factors for prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Um, I do think that uh, these these two on this side are uh, huge impacts within our modern society. Chronic sleep deprivation and night shift work are clearly associated with issues and upticks in the development of diabetes. Um, unfortunately, yes, age increases our insulin uh, resistance and age does indeed increase our risk for the development of type two diabetes as well. So, you know, the major obstacle in maintaining control in a patient who has diabetes is progressive beta cell failure and drugs that induce hypoglycemia. So we all know that hypoglycemia is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. And so the development of newer drugs that do not cause hypoglycemia has been a huge um, impact. And of course, we have not been so good, at least at finding drugs that regrow beta cells, 
but I do feel like we do have medications that help to preserve beta cell function. So what's the method to the madness? Because it, we do have a lot of medications to choose from in the realm of type 2 diabetes. And I, I can certainly tell you that until uh, two years ago, the American Diabetes Association algorithm that, by the way, is published every year in January was completely unhelpful. It just basically said, start with metformin and then you can choose whatever you want. There was really not any method to the madness. So that has changed radically. And the ADA guidelines and the algorithms in the last two years have been very, very different and very much directed. So um, before I launch into that, I think we all know the guidelines about what we're trying to get to in terms of control. Um, the American Diabetes Association says an A1C of less than 7%, American College of Endocrinology less than 6.5. And I would like to point out that, you know, this is a truly arbitrary cutoff, you guys. Um, this was based on when we start to see complications really accelerate. So what is a normal glucose level and what is a normal A1C is based on the, when complications really start to exponentially increase. So uh, many of us know that uh, currently 5.7 A1C is uh, and above is felt to be consistent with prediabetes. So the reality about the fact that is less than 6.5 good enough um, is that um, if you can, and this is emphasized here, if you can get an A1C lower than that um, with drugs that don't increase the risk for hypoglycemia and the patient is tolerating it, you certainly can do that. Um, I do wanna say higher goals of 8% in people who have shorter lifespans and other issues and in older adults with good function, um, seven to 7.5% is still the goal. So one thing that I do think is important to talk to patients about, and I do this all the time is, you know, you say, hey, Joe, I want your A1C less than 7%. Joe has no idea what that means. <laughs> so Joe has a finger stick monitor. So you say to Joe, you can test your blood sugars prior to a meal and two hours post meal. If you want an A1C under seven, your pre-meal glucose needs to be less than 130 and your two hour post meal glucose needs to be less than 180. Um, I'm gonna be talking briefly about continuous glucose monitoring devices at the end of the talk, you guys, but I do think that it is absolutely uh, eye-opening and Medicare, Medicaid, every insurance company out there will cover your patient to wear a CGM for a week, a continuous glucose monitoring device for a week. Um, that's placed by our diabetes education team. And that is mind blowing. Um, it gives you your glucose every five minutes and it lets Joe know what stress does to his glucose, what exercise does to his glucose and what certain meals do to glucose levels. And it is really, really informative. Um, so uh, just a brief overview, we know what diabetes does to the body. Uh, microvascular is retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, and then macrovascular in terms of stroke, cardiovascular disease, and peripheral vascular disease. So obviously we're trying to prevent these com uh, complications. So here's the paradigm shift. It's not just about controlling blood sugars anymore, you guys. It's about treating the disease. It's about trying to prevent the things that are killing diabetics. It's about trying to not induce hypoglycemia. It's about helping with weight loss. It's not just about controlling blood sugars. So that is the big um, shift in the world of diabetes. So, you know, what we know is that, you know, and again, we're thinking beyond just A1C control. Um, almost 70% of people with diabetes who are 65 or older die of a form of heart disease. 16% die of stroke. Adults with diabetes are two to four times more likely to die from heart disease than those without. And 40% of people with type 2 diabetes will go on to develop kidney disease no matter what we do. So this is a huge issue. We have, even with ACE inhibitors, even with tighter glucose control, we have not been able to budge this number. SGLT2 medications have dramatically altered this. Um, GLP-1s to a certain extent as well. Heart disease is the major cause of death if you have kidney disease. And the deadly dual is considered to be, duo is considered to be cardiovascular disease and CKD. 
of which a third of type 2 diabetics have. So again, it's not enough to just control A1C. A1C is critically important, you guys, but we now have drugs that impact this directly. Um, so before I launch into the discussion of um, these drugs, I think I just want to over, uh, give you a, a visual of how SGLT2 medications work. Um, these, there are three on the market right now, Jardiance, uh, Farsiga, and Invokana. These are tablets that you take once a day. And these drugs basically partially inhibit the SGLT2 receptor in the proximal tubule and um, uh, decrease the reabsorption of glucose. So you're getting glucosuria with these drugs and you're losing calories with these drugs. But we know that there is something much more profound going on with these medications. And we're still trying to sort out how it is that these, these drugs have so earth shatteringly um, altered cardiovascular events and the development of CKD. We know that these drugs um, increase GLP-1. We know that they increase glucagon. And we also know that they directly increase ketones, which has been an interesting issue because ketones are the preferred fuel for the cardiac muscle. So it is an interesting arena where there's a lot of, of studies going on. And again, sort of out of the purview of this lecture to go through all the theories as to the mechanisms of the protective benefit of these meds. What about GLP-1 medications? So GLP-1s are peptides that are produced in the small intestine. Um, the first GLP-1 medication came out almost 20 years ago in the world of type 2 diabetes. That was known as Biata. Many of you on the call are familiar with this. And I remember this drug very well because, you know, patients are not necessarily excited about um, doing an injection. But when Biata came out and there was uh, publication that this helped with weight loss, um, it could have been a dart gun people wanted this drug. So there are now the following uh, GLP-1s on the market. Uh, Bidurian, which is exenotide, which is what is in Bi what was in Bieta. Um, Trulicity, dulaglutide, Victoza, liraglutide, and um, Ozempic, which is semiglutide. Um, and then there is an oral form of semiglutide that is called Rebelsis. So the way that these drugs work is that GLP-1 peptides um, bind in the hypothalamus to profoundly decrease appetite and craving. They also slow stomach emptying. So they make your stomach effectively smaller. So if you try to eat as much as you usually do at a meal, you will not feel good. So this drug tells people to pay attention to their satiety and it also shuts off appetite and craving. In the pancreas, this drug stimulates first and second phase insulin response. So first phase insulin response is when I smell food, my pancreas is primed to kick out insulin. So that very first blast of insulin, when your food gets absorbed through the small intestine, is critical in managing postprandial glucose levels. And this drug helps to augment the first phase response, and it also augments the prolonged second phase response. It also shuts off glucagon when you're eating, which it sh our glucagon should go away when we eat. But in the world of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, that does not happen. So glucagon is still mobilizing stored sugar while you are eating. Now, both of these impacts are physiologic, meaning that as soon as glucose starts to fall, the insulin goes away and the glucagon comes back. So these drugs are not associated with hypoglycemia. And I should emphasize that SGLT2 medications are not associated with hypoglycemia as well. So this, um, again, I, I would love, I could spend an hour going through the data on the uh, benefits of these medications, but I'm gonna try to go through these fairly quickly. Um, this was the study that came out of the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 that I have to say was truly mind boggling. So this is the decrease in cardiovascular deaths seen with the use of empagliflozin, which is Jardians. Um, in the world of type 2 diabetes. And what it showed was almost a 40% decrease in cardiovascular death at two years, 48 months. Separation of the curves was seen at three months. This was staggering. Um, 
so I think the the other things that were looked at was all cause mortality in that study as well as hospitalizations for heart failure. So all cause mortality was reduced by 32% and hospitalizations for congestive heart failure was decreased by 35%. These, these this data has subsequently been shown to be the case for other uh, there are other GLP-1 medications and we'll review that a little bit as well. Um, this is liraglutide, which of course is a GLP-1. This is Victoza. Um, this was a study and you can see this is 54 months out. This is looking at cardiovascular death and you can see about a 22% decrease with GLP-1 um, liraglutide with reference to cardiovascular death. Um, there was no difference in non-fatal MI or stroke, but trended in a beneficial direction. Um, and then this is the MACE outcome of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke, um, showing about a 13% reduction with Victoza or liraglutide. So, you know, all of us you know, if back in our medical school days uh, what looked at and are familiar with the statistic of the number needed to treat to prevent one death across landmark trials in patients at high risk for cardiovascular um, disease. So this is just a comparison, and I want to emphasize a couple of things. This is using Zocor or Simvastatin for five years, ACE inhibitor, Ramipril, for five years, Empagliflozin or Jardiance for three years, and Liraglutide or Victoza for three and a half years. So you had to treat 30 people for five years with Simvastatin to, produ to reduce it by one death. You had to treat 56 people with an ACE inhibitor for five years, and you had to treat 39 people for three years with empagliflozin to prevent one death. And you can see here um, the less effect of the Victoza or Liraglutide. Now, this is just data on decreasing of um, the development of CKD. And again, I wanna emphasize, this has been a very frustrating arena for type two diabetes, you guys. Again, you know, 40% of people with type 2 diabetes develop chronic kidney disease. And we have not been able to impact that with better um, A1C control. So this was the IMPA-REG renal outcome trial um, showing a 44% reduction in the doubling rate of creatinine and a 55% reduction in renal replacement therapy, meaning dialysis. Um, the composite renal outcome is defined as progression to albuminuria or progression of albuminuria, changes in the EFR typically defined as a doubling of serum creatinine and the incidence of end-stage renal disease or needing renal replacement and then death from a renal cause. So this, keep that in mind in the next slide because this is composite renal outcome. And this is a slide looking on the left at the GLP-1 medications on the right, looking at the SGLT-2 medications in terms of composite renal outcome. So the Excel trial is exenatide, that's by Durian. The leader trial is Victoza. The sustain trial is Ozempic. And the rewind trial is Trulicity. And what you can see in these trials is that the reduction in composite renal outcome is if you average this somewhere in the neighborhood of about 17 to 20% reduction in renal outcome. If you move to the right and you look at the SGLT2 inhibitors, so uh, the DECLARE trial is Farsiga, the, the, the CANVAS trial is Invokana, uh, Impareg is Jardiance, and then again, this is um, uh, Invokana. And in this trial, you can see uh, a, a approaching 50% reduction in the development or the uh, of chronic um, kidney issues or disease or the decrease in renal outcome um, measured by the composite. So this is the new algorithm. Um, it may not look so user-friendly. Um, I am gonna break it down, you guys, into a very simplistic approach and you will have a copy of these slides. Um, but I wanna point out the following. This um, states the first line therapy is metformin and comprehensive lifestyle education. Um, one thing that I, I can't overemphasize enough, enough is that um, diabetes education has been shown to decrease A1Cs by an average of 1%, just seeing a diabetes educator, learning about nutrition, learning about complications, um, learning about management of diabetes. 
um, the average number of patients in the United States that have ever received diabetes education is 5%. It is considered a standard of care at day one of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes to receive diabetes education. So I cannot emphasize enough that that is really critically important. So after this patient hopefully addresses lifestyle um, and goes on metformin, and by the way, metformin, and you'll see this in a minute, is not a requirement, but typically has been the first nine, uh, line therapy. Then you need to do the following. Does Joe have cardiovascular disease? or B is at high risk for cardiovascular disease. Does Joe have heart failure? Does Joe have CKD? If the answer to that is yes, then that drives you down this pathway on the left. If the answer to that is no, the other questions are, does Joe have a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia? Well, I would argue that everybody has a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia, but certainly in the elderly or people that live alone, this is a huge issue. Um, and so then you go down this pathway and we'll break this out a little bit more thoroughly in just a second. Does Joe have a compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss? I would argue that there's not a type two diabetic on the planet that doesn't fit into this category. Um, and so if you have a compelling need to minimize that, then you would go down this pathway. Now I will point out that these slides also say what you should avoid. So if indeed Joe has heart failure, then you need to avoid thiazolidinediones like Actos. If Joe has hypoglycemia, then you wanna try to put off as long as possible sulfonylurea therapy and insulin. Um, if indeed Joe doesn't want to gain weight, then you need to put off sulfonylureas, insulin, and you want to not use thiazolidinediones. Here's the take home message for all of us on this call. And I think that this is something that we are all very well aware of. And that is that cost is a huge issue. And um, as many of you know, the um, Congress is, is uh, passing this legislation to put a cap on insulin cost. Insulin itself is staggeringly expensive, you guys. So that cost, if cost is the major issue, metformin is dirt cheap, sulfonylureas are dirt cheap, and actose or thiazolidinediones are dirt cheap. Those are all generic medications. Um, unfortunately, this is, sulfonylureas cause hypoglycemia and weight gain, TZDs can cause weight gain, um, and then of course, insulin therapy is not as cheap as it used to be. The cheapest insulins are the insulins that are more associated with hypoglycemia, like NPH and regular insulin. So um, that is a big problem in the world of diabetes and, and certainly I'm happy to take some questions about that. So let's break this out a little bit more simplistically. So this is uh, again, something that I wanna call out that this should be considered, these drugs and these categories are considered to be independent decisions of A1C control. So if a Joe's A1C is 6.5 and he has heart failure, he needs to be on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, and they are also independent of metformin use. So you do not have to be on metformin to consider these drugs. So again, if Joe has cardiovascular disease or high risk, first you should be considering GLP-1s or SGLT2. At heart failure, SGLT2 is the first go-to. Avoid TZDs and DPP-4s. CKD, SGLT2 preferred first, GLP-1 an alternative. Um, and if you have metformin on board, metformin is contraindicated with an EGFR of less than 30. SGLT2s are now going to be pushed down to be able to be utilized to an EGFR of 25, and they will likely go lower than that. Um, and bidurian is contraindicated for an EGFR that's less than 30. That is not true of Victoza, Ozempic, and Trulicity. Minimization of hypoglycemia. Again, you can see the category here. Try to avoid sulfonylurea and insulin. And obesity, GLP-1s first and SGLT2s. Um, the, the magic uh, cocktail for controlling diabetes without hypoglycemia and inducing weight loss is metformin, a GLP-1, and an SGLT-2. So this um, breaks it down even a little bit more um, granular. So let's just say Joe has established cardiovascular disease or is at high risk. 
if the, if either of these apply, then you want to choose a GLP-1 agonist with cardiovascular benefit. And the ones that have been studied and shown to be of cardiovascular benefit are Victoza, Trulicity, and Ozempic. And SGLT2s with cardiovascular benefit currently are Jardiance and Invokana. Um, as we all know, you know, studies uh, are done by virtue of selection of certain populations. Um, is it, you know, true that Farsiga really doesn't have as much cardiovascular benefit as Jardiance and, and Invokana? I think that's highly unlikely. Um, but currently, Jardiance and Invokana are called out separately. So again, Joe has cardiovascular disease or at high risk these drugs should be considered to be placed on board. Heart failure, by far and away, um, SGLT2 inhibitors. And the cardiovascular world is way on board with this, you guys. Um, if you haven't gotten a note from a cardiovascular doc who's seen your patient for type 2 diabetes and heart failure saying, hey, can you please put Joe on an SGLT2 inhibitor, that would be unusual. So I know that our cardiovascular team at Swedish um, is pushing this extremely hard, and so is the American Heart Association um, and American College of Cardiology. So um, SGLT2 inhibitors, huge impact on this. All three, Jardians, Invokana, and Orofarsiga would be um, choices. Now, what about chronic kidney disease? So chronic kidney disease is a little more interesting. Um, you'll see that it's broken out here as to whether or not you're spilling albumin or whether you're not spilling albumin. EGFR um, of less than 60 is currently the definition for CKD. Um, so if you're spilling protein, the preferred is an SGLT2 first. An alternative or an add-on if you need it would be a GLP-1 second that has established cardiovascular benefit. Why? Chronic kidney disease, most common cause for death is cardiovascular. We know that that is the deadly duo. So SGLT2s that are preferred in this setting, all three, Jardians, Invokana, Farsiga. Um, again, you guys, 44% reduction in the doubling of creatinine um, in individuals with, um, with CKD. And then GLP-1s with cardiovascular benefit, Victoza, Trulicity, Ozempic. What about if you're negative for urine protein? Doesn't matter in terms of SGLT2. Um, yes, please use it. Um, interestingly enough, they're saying that uh, Jardians and Invokana may be a little more in this category. I think that that's probably splitting hairs a bit. I think any SGLT2 is gonna be of benefit. And then a GLP-1 with cardiovascular benefit as well. So that, um, again, I think just calling out uh, SGLT2s in the world of heart failure and kidney failure being the, the first line that you would bring up. Now, what about minimizing hypoglycemia and trying to target obesity? Again, consider, um, you know, independent of, of other things, but the realization is that minimizing hypoglycemia is truly trying to avoid sulfonylureas and insulin for as long as possible. Consider uh, GLP-1s, SGLT-2s, thiazolidinediones, uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors. Obviously, metformin does not cause hypoglycemia either. With reference to promoting weight loss, by far and away, uh, GLP-1 agonists are the most profoundly impactful and, and, in fact, are being used in the weight loss world independent of the diagnosis of diabetes. And this actually is a uh, list of most weight loss to least weight loss. So the most effective for weight loss is Ozempic, uh, followed by Victoza, followed by Trulicity, although now that Trulicity is available as a 4.5, that may be more in the range of the Victoza. Um, by Durian and then Adlixin, which um, is not used so much in the U.S. And then again, avoiding sulfonylureas, uh, insulin, and TZD because we know that all of those can be associated with weight gain. So um, in terms of the 2022 standards of care of, for CKD, um, I just want to call out that, yes, it's optimizing glucose control. So A1C control is critical in terms of progression. For patients with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor, um, as long as our EGFR is 25 or above, 25, you guys. This, um, the re there's been a recent study in the heart failure world showing that using these drugs below 
an EGFR of 25 was still profoundly protective against further decline in kidney function. Um, and then of course, urine albumin that is greater than 300, this is um, LCL22s are recommended. If a patient with type two diabetes and CKD um, has CKD, consider using SGLT2s additionally for cardiovascular risk reduction when the EGFR is at 25 um, uh, or above in terms of uh, milliliters uh, per minute. So just to hammer this home a little bit harder, these are the agents that are specifically under specific considerations. The GLP-1s with cardiovascular benefit, Ozempic, Trulicity, Victoza, the SGLT2 inhibitors with cardiovascular benefit, Jardians and Invokana, Farsiga I think is going to be into this category as well. SGLT2 inhibitors with heart failure benefit, all three. SGLT2 inhibitors that reduce chronic kidney disease progression, all three. And GLP-1s with good efficacy on weight loss, all of them, but Ozempic the most powerful. What about safety and tolerability concerns? So. Um, what have we learned from cardiovascular outcome trials? So I think what's interesting is that, you know, the FDA now requires that we show that medications are safe from a cardiovascular perspective, both the possibility of, of improving cardiovascular events, but also not increasing them. So there have been over 7,000 patients worldwide um, studied in um, these categories of GLP-1 and SGLT-2 inhibitors. And when these, when drugs first come to market, you know, there's uh, reports on what these drugs may or may not be doing in terms of side effects. And those, those side effect profiles oftentimes hang with us even after we've shown with larger studies that they are really not of concern. So what I wanna point out is the following. GLP-1 agonists, no increased risk of acute kidney injury, no increased risk for pancreatitis, no increased risk for pancreatic cancer. Yes, if you have mentalary thyroid cancer, which was only seen in rats, there's a relative contraindication to this for sure. Gallbladder disease um, is a relative uh, contraindication only to say that significant weight loss by any mechanism can potentially induce gallbladder disease. Um, retinopathy progression was only reported in the semiglutide or azimbic trial. And the reality here is that any tightening of control of A1C by any mechanism, whether it's insulin, whether it's amaryl, um, will um, potentially accelerate retinopathy. So really the cause and effect of specifically GLP-1s on the development of retinopathy versus tightening of control is under significant question. And then um, volume depletion, nausea, and vomiting from GLP-1s can be mitigated by starting low and going slow and counseling patients that they shouldn't be eating as much as they used to eat on these meds. Pay attention to satiety signals. What about SGLT2s? No increased risk of acute kidney injury. So when these drugs first came out, and you will see this, a slight uptick in creatinine when you first start the medication, but that does come back down, typically within three months. And again, profound protection against the development of CKD and the progression of CKD. No increased risk for hyperkalemia, no consistent increased risk for fractures, no increased risk for urinary tract infections, increased risk for GU infection, Fournier's gangrene was a report of a very um, rare complication of uh, yeast infections. This is seen with equal frequency in the diabetes world, irrelevant to whether you are on an SGLT2. So the reality about yeast infections with SGLT2s, because you are indeed urinating out more sugar, is that if you have a patient who has frequent recurrent yeast infections, and this is more common in women, as you guys know, then the chance that they will get yeast infections with this drug is about 25%. Um, if indeed they don't have yeast infections routinely, then the chance of a yeast infection is less than 5%. And we can talk about this, but I classically, if a patient gets a yeast infection on this medication, I give them a round of Diflucan. If they get a second one, we talk about, do we wanna do Diflucan one tablet once a week to decrease the incidence? And that's certainly something to consider, especially because these drugs can be so profoundly protective. 
Um, what about diabetic ketoacidosis? We know these drugs increase ketone production. That is why they are contraindicated in patients with type 1 diabetes. And I want to call out that late onset autoimmune diabetes still goes missed and undiagnosed. And the problem with that is that, um, you know, 70% of the adult population is overweight or obese. So anybody who comes in um, with it, you know, over the age of 35 and certainly over 40 with diabetes is oftentimes labeled a type 2. Um, and I think you need to be aware that certainly if there's not a family history for type 2, certainly if Joe has a normal body mass index, they need to be screened for late onset autoimmune diabetes. Now, the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis in the type 2 diabetic population on an SGLT2 is 0.05%. It is exceedingly low. However, the risk factors to development uh, develop this include surgery and severe infection. So currently the recommendations are to stop SGLT2 inhibitors 72 hours ahead of planned surgeries. So 72 hours ahead is the recommendation for stopping SGLT2s. I will remind you that metformin is recommended to stop uh, 24 to 48 hours ahead of a planned surgery, because again, if something catastrophically happens in the operating room um, and you get renal failure, metformin can cause lactic acidosis. So again, DKA risk is accelerated with surgeries and severe infections and then do not use in type ones. Um, the possible risk of increased uh, uh, amputations, um, that was seen only with canaclofloxacin. Um, which is in Vocana, only in one study. And there is obviously more information that probably needs to be gathered on this. And then volume mitigation, because this is volume depletion mitigation, just making sure people are drinking plenty of fluids because these drugs are mild diuretics. So in summary, SGLT2 and GLP-1 medications decrease cardiovascular events and CKD, induce weight loss, do not cause hypoglycemia, help to control A1C and improve pancreatic longevity based on pre-diabetes studies. And so that'll be interesting to see how this plays out. The, side, the, the downside is they're costly. Now this slide, I have no intention of going through in detail. Uh, I'm sure all of you are like, thank goodness. Um, this is the slide that actually um, talks about um, the issue of what do you do when you've gotten Joe on all oral agents and his A1C is still problematic. Um, you've added a basal insulin, what do you do next? And so the call out really in the ADA is before you go to mealtime insulin, if Joe is not on a GLP-1, please consider putting him on it. It is equally if not more effective in lowering A1C when added to a basal insulin. It has a lower risk of hypoglycemia it is less likely to cause weight gain, and it is associated with less glycemic variability throughout the day. Now, glycemic variability is something that I'll show you in just a moment when I show you continuous glucose monitoring devices, but that's the swinging during the day of glucose levels, which is predominantly based on post-meal um, elevations. These are all the insulins that are out there now. Um, there are a lot of them, and they all have different biology biological half-lifes. The fastest insulin out there is inhaled insulin, which is Ephrezza. Um, that is this purple graph, and you can see this gets in very rapidly and does have a shorter tail. The longest um, insulin currently is insulin Detamir, and this is actually the flattest insulin as well. So treatment of type 2 diabetes, treat the disease, please, not just the A1C. We know that treating diabetes long-term requires a multiple medication. Um, it should be based upon the pathogenic um, abnormalities, not just A1C reduction. Um, it should be individualized, of course, start it early and, and add therapy quickly if A1Cs go up so that you, do, you can mitigate complication development definitely lifestyle modification and weight loss medications and metabolic surgery should be considered early in terms of preventing, uh, preventing progressive pancreatic failure. So I wanna take the last just couple of, of moments to talk about diabetes technology, which is exploding. Um, diabetes, um, if I had my way, 
every single patient on the planet with diabetes and even pre-diabetes would have access to a continuous glucose monitoring device. Um, these are the kind of statistics that you get from these devices. Um, so Joe wears a device for a couple weeks. You could upload this. This is a 14-day sensor upload. And you can see that uh, Joe is 70% in range between 70 and 180. Um, and so this is the ideal is at least 70% of blood sugars in range, less than 4%, less than 70 and minimal above 50. Now, glycemic variability, and I'll show you this on the next slide. Glycemic, and this is another CGM um, device that is used on the market. Glycemic variability is this standard deviation. So the orange line is this average glucose, and this is the standard deviation. Glycemic variability has been shown to be tightly correlated with complication development. So this plays into an A1C is not an A1C is not an A1C. So you can have an A1C of 7.5 and bounce from 40 to 400, or you can have an A1C of 7 to 7.5 and bounce between 70 and 180. What is better? The 70 to 180. So this coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation of blood sugars during the day, ideally should be less than 30%. So you get this printout and you can say, you know what, Joe, it looks like you are going up at about 8 p.m. What's going on? Well, you know, I'm grazing in front of the television. So addressing behavioral change, making um, blood sugar changes based on a time of day where Joe's getting into trouble um, can be exceedingly helpful. And again, you can wear this, uh, put this on a patient for a week. Um, and that gives them a lot of data. Now, this is, um, again, not something I have time to go through. This is data from a closed-loop insulin pump. Closed-loop insulin pumps are pumps that are regulated and uh, off of a continuous glucose monitor that communicates with the pump. So glucoses are fed into the pump every five minutes, and the pump continuously adjusts background basal uh, insulin delivery. Um, you can see this patient was only in auto mode, i.e. in closed loop 75% of the time. We want to see it higher if we can get it there. Um, you can see that their time and range here was about 55%, but I will tell you that many patients will have time and ranges of 85 to 90% on closed loop pumps. Um, with very, very low hypoglycemic events. So closed loop pumps are designed to chase you if you're going high and to back off and shut down to prevent hypoglycemia if your sugars are dropping low. And these devices are getting more and more and more accurate and more and more sophisticated. Um, they're the closest thing we have to, you know, sort of mimicking pancreatic function. Um, and so that is the end. I know I have uh, talked for quite a long stretch and uh, I was hoping to cut off a little bit earlier, but I don't know if you guys have any questions, um, but thanks so much for your time. Such a great summary. Thank you very much, uh, Fran. Um, and uh, Scott, uh, did did you have a question, uh, sure. Scott Kennedy? Yeah, I had one question on the uh, prevention of progression to diabetes. We, we with all the uh, tides, with all the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists, they all seem to uh, induce weight loss. You know, they're helpful for weight loss. Are are they involved with prevention of progression? I didn't see that on the list. Yes, they are. Um, and Scott, the issue is is that. Um, uh, there have been multiple studies that have come out. Um, there's certain, the one that's been studied the most is probably Victoza, showing a decrease in the progression to diabetes of about 70% or upwards of 70%. Um, I don't know if you guys know that Ozempic that has been released in the weight loss world at a 2.4 milligram weekly dose, so Ozempic can be given as a one milligram weekly dose in the diabetes world. That will change in the next couple months. We will be able to walk it up to two milligrams. 2.4 milligrams of Ozempic weekly, 30% of people lost 20% of their body weight. That approaches gastric sleeve surgery. 50% of patients lost 15% of their body weight. These drugs are incredibly powerful. So if we know that weight loss is a huge driver for the prevention of type 2 diabetes, or for that matter, the preservation of pancreatic function and control of, of type 2, um, you know, it makes sense that, that these drugs would be real game changers. Uh, do others uh, uh, watching remotely have questions, please? Please uh, 
sound off, it'd be great. <laughs> Diane, yeah, hoping these, these slides are helpful, you guys. I think the simplistic um, slide sets that we developed for the primary care with an SMG, um, so to take the algorithm and break it down um, in these, you know, sort of three or four slides that followed, um, was found to be very helpful for with our primary care groups. I'm hoping that that is helpful for you guys as well. This is Dr. Duffy. Can you hear me? Um, I can, but I might have you speak a little bit louder. Okay, I can be much louder if needed. Okay. Uh, so thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'm hospitalist and I think I will research a little bit more how we can apply this in a hospital on discharge. But uh, you're absolutely right. The way I was trained, start metformin, and then it's a wide range of choices, and there was no guidance. So when do you recommend to start insulin right now? Is there cutoff hemoglobin A1C, or it's still kind of, uh, what's up for recommendation now? Yeah, so, so it's a great question. Um, I certainly would say that people who have new onset type type two diabetes um, who come in with blood sugars that are just out the bazoo, which I know as a hospitalist you oftentimes see, we we do oftentimes start people on insulin to acutely get them down and to get rid of glucose toxicity. Um, but the presumption is, especially in new onset type twos, is that they have plenty of pancreatic function around. So as soon as you and as you get their glucose down, so if somebody comes in with glucoses that are greater than 300, you are going to need to to probably start insulin to get them down. But the reality is, is that I do not add basal insulin in um, until I have, you know, if the patient can afford and tolerate um, metformin, SGLT2, GLP-1. Um, so that's the three drugs that I use if they don't have good control of A1Cs um, and th so they're continuing to, to have pancreatic decline, then I will add in basal insulin. Um, I, tr I tend to avoid sulfonylureas um, as much as I can, but cost is such a huge issue that we oftentimes have to use them. Basal insulin has less hypoglycemia than using a sulfonylurea. Um, and interestingly enough, mealtime insulin has less hypoglycemia than sulfonylureas, um, but sulfonylureas are dirt cheap, so I do use them. I don't know if that if that answered your complete question, but I don't. I try not to use insulin until I have used metformin, SGLT2s, and GLP1s, and only then am I escaping control. Yeah. Do you oh, this is Dr. Duffy. I have one more question. You mentioned yeah. about the multidisciplinary approach on um, management of diabetes, but I thought I was under the impression outpatient insurance does not cover counseling. I mean, insurance doesn't cover outpatient diabetic counseling. Is this true? No, it's uh, great. I'm so glad you asked that. A hundred percent coverage. Coordinated care, Molina, Medicare, Primera is the standard of care in the United States um, to cover diabetes education. Um, there are a certain number of hours per year, but it is 100% coverage. So um, there's really no reason why everybody, everybody with diabetes should not be getting diabetes education. It is recommended to do it at day one of diagnosis for everyone. The, you, uh, in terms of repeating diabetes education, it is covered if a patient is not in control, again, across the board. So good coverage, you guys. And one more question, I promise the last one. No worries. Um, you mentioned that there was one medication which is indicated for weight loss. And we know weight loss is good in preventing diabetes. Is would insurance cover this weightless weightless medic weight loss medication, weight loss medication. prior um, diagnosis? Yeah, of so it's, yeah, so that's that's a great question, you guys. Um, so uh, the insurance coverage for weight loss medications is highly variable. Uh, Fentermine, which has been around for twenty plus years, is you can get it for as cheap as eight bucks a month. Um, you can prescribe Topamax as a generic and it's covered. So the fentramine Topamax combo for weight loss is something that's easy to get. Um, well, Butrin uh, is something that's used in the weight loss world. It is covered universally. Naltrexone you can get cheaply and the Wellbutrin Naltrexone, Naltrexone combo for weight loss drugs is something that can get covered. 
um, GLP ones are by far and away the most effective. We have been very successful recently getting GLP ones covered. Interestingly enough, fingers crossed for prediabetes and metabolic syndrome. We've been sending it in over and over and over again and using the Providence Central Pharmacy known as Credina. We have trained them on doing the heavy lifting on prior authorizations for these drugs. If you have overt type 2 diabetes, GLP-1s are covered. So getting it for type 2 diabetics with weight issues is not the, the stumbling block. It's really trying to get it for people with obesity without diabetes. But prediabetes metabolic syndrome has been something that we've been getting more and more success with. So um, we're excited about it. And I think, you know, given the fact that universally every single, um, so the American Heart Association, American College of Endocrinology, um, American College of Cardiology, uh, American Medical Association, every association has come out and stated obesity is a disease state and should be covered and treated with these medications. Um, we are hoping that weight loss medications are gonna start being covered more robustly. Thank you. Yeah. We have a hand raised from- Yeah, that's, hi, this is Dick Van Kelker. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so the, the, the obvious elephant in the room is that high school seniors, males are 35 pounds heavier than when I graduated in 1962. Yeah. Uh, than they are now. The, the, you know, that's a huge issue. It's a societal issue. What are we doing about obesity? What are we treating diabetes? We're treating, the horse is already out of the barn. Absolutely. I couldn't concur with you more. Um, so by the way, this is, this is a huge area of research. Um, I was at a lecture um, at the obesity meetings about five years ago where the lecturer showed two photos side by side. A photo of the parade route in Dallas, Texas, when uh, President Kennedy was shot. Um, and then a photo now basically five years ago, exact same location in a parade route. In the photo with, with uh, Kennedy's assassination, there was not a single patient in the, person in the crowd who was obese. In the photo that was done recently, there was not a single patient in the crowd except for children who wasn't obese. So something has happened in our society that cannot be attributed only to the fact that we're not eating well and maybe we're not as active. There is something profound going on that has radically altered weight worldwide. And this, it, the, the, the field of epigenetics is felt to be the issue. And, and this is something that's very interesting, you guys. So it, you know, epigenetics, as you know, is basically the uh, uh, unmasking or the masking of genes. So it's not changing our DNA, but it's it's protein binding that allows DNA to be expressed or to not express. This can be inherited in one generation. So if a mother or a father, so it can be male as well, can be the sperm or the egg, has obesity, that epigenetic change will be passed on to the child. So this is a very kind of terrifying arena that this is actually something that is genetically being inherited. So we need to be aggressively addressing weight. I agree completely. It is a multi-pronged approach. It is absolutely nutrition. It is activity as well, but it is something much more profound. Now, what's interesting is it does intervention change that passage of genes. We don't know that so much, but we do have some data in animal models that if you alter the weight in the mother or the father mouse, that epigenetic change is not passed on to the child. So big area of research. And yes, it's a huge issue. There was just one question in the chat, um, but I think you touched on it a bit. Can you comment on the cost of meds? Mm -hmm. So these meds, are, these meds are expensive. So um, uh, GLP-1 medication average cost for a month cash price is about $750. Now, let me just tell you that the cost of insulin, basal insulin, is in the neighborhood of $400 to $500 a month. Okay, so a little perspective on that. Um, you can get these drugs from Canada, and we do it all the time, for half price. There are Canadian pharmacies that we send the prescription to. They contact the patient. They ship it. So you can get GLP-1s for about 350 bucks from Canada. Um, 
these drugs are covered. Um, you know, I'm talking GLP ones right now um, by insurance. The problem is Medicare and the donut hole. So that's a big issue. And obviously, coordinated care. You know, Molina has been very good at covering these meds. Um, SGLT twos a little bit less expensive than those uh, the GLP ones for a monthly price. Um, I'm not sure that I can give you the actual monthly price, but I would probably say it's in the neighborhood of 300 ish for most um, SGLT two meds. Um, so again, you know, the donut hole is a big issue. Um, the donut hole is a big issue for insulin, you guys. It's a big, I mean, I have multiple patients who are insulin dependent and I have to flip them to MPH and regular when they go through the donut hole, which is terrifying. I mean, these people are elderly, they have heart disease, they have a hypoglycemic event, they're going to have a heart attack. So it is a big issue. Excellent. Well, thanks again so much, uh, and uh, just a great presentation summary, and and um, appreciate your time. And uh, please come back. And, of course, uh, no, it's um, always a pleasure to be invited. I appreciate it. And. Uh,